today's talk is called Three Words to Empower Us to Live Revival. Okay, so as many of you may know, I've gone back to graduate school. And it has been really hard. I'm getting my master's in theology. In this process, I asked that God would give me a one-liner. You know how sometimes you just need a one-liner to get you through everything? So here it is, all right? So he gave me this beautiful one-liner. And he has uh, had to rewire my thought patterns so that when I begin to get spun, as Lauren would say, like in the middle of the night, anybody here ever wake up in the middle of the night? Yeah, I, mean, I do. Uh, and I hear these whispers of discouragement in my ear about anything. It doesn't have to be about school, but it can be about my family, it can be about my choices, it can be about anything. If I can stop and implement these three words, literally a rush of peace will come over me. A rush of peace. And then I'm released from a grip of fear and anxiety and worry. And then I feel this revival in my spirit and I feel refreshed and renewed. And I can go forward and I can either go back to sleep or get on with whatever it is that I feel like God is calling me to do in the moment. So we can go forward, as she was saying, pick up our mat and go forward in the peace and in the confidence of the Lord, not our own abilities. So here's the one-liner that God gave me. I found it written in one of my journals. So I was so excited when I came across it. I was like, wow, that's so cool. There it is. Domini Deus in Simplicate Cordes Mia, Laetis Betuli Universa. Now, does that mean, I mean, does that floor you? No, I'm just kidding. Okay, it means, um, it means this. It means, Lord God, in simplicity of heart, I have joyfully offered you everything. Lord God, in simplicity of heart, I have joyfully offered you everything. This was inspired, this is part of an offertory prayer in the Ambrosian Liturgy. And it was inspired by 1 Chronicles 29, 17 through 18. And now let me just give you a little history on that, which you know I love history. Um, David, this is David's prayer in this First Chronicles. And he was about to offer an incredible amount of treasure to be used for the building of the temple, of the first temple. Now, the Bible states how much it was. 100,000 talents of gold. Okay, a talent is 100 pounds. So we're talking millions of pounds of gold. A million talents of silver. So a million times 100 talents of silver. Quantities of bronze and iron too great to measure and wood and stone. So we're talking a large amount of treasure David's about to give. So what makes this so touching is this. It was David's idea to build the temple, right? The very first temple that was ever built, not the tabernacle, but the permanent structure for God to be worshiped by Israelites. But God in his infinite wisdom wanted a man of peace to build his temple. And David was a man of war. He had blood on his hands from so much bloodshed. So Nathan the prophet had to come to David and say, not you, not you, but your son Solomon, because Solomon means peace. He'll get to do it. Now, I don't know about you, but I kind of think I would have gotten a little bit irritated. <laughs> like, well, that was my idea, and I really want to be able to do this for you, God. But God said, guess what? I'm going to give you the grace. I'm going to give you the grace to get through this. And he did. And David, it says in the Psalms, it says he offered this beautiful prayer of praise to God. And we read it again in First Chronicles. And so instead of getting angry or bitter because his plans didn't work out, he praises God, and he goes forward with a mission. And he enables his son to be able to do it. And so here's what it is. Um, he considers the privilege and the credit to go to his son as part of his mission. And so instead of the temple, to this day, being known as David's big idea temple and David being the underwriter of the temple, it's simply known as Solomon's temple, Solomon's temple. So here's what David said when he was offering this great amount of treasure. Now here it is, it's beautiful. It says, I know, my God, that you put hearts to the test and that you take pleasure in integrity. With a whole heart, I have willingly given all these things 
And now with joy, I have seen your people here present also giving to you generously. Lord, God of our ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, keep such thoughts in the hearts and minds of your people forever and direct their hearts towards you. How amazing. This prayer that David prayed 3,000 years ago is still in effect today. You know why? Because we today, still in our hearts, are seeking God. This is an answer to David's prayer. David reigned about 1,000 BC. And from this passage, God gave me three words to use as my mantra. So here they are. Ready? Simple, pure, holy. Simple, pure, holy. All right? So let's unpack them. And as we do, I'm going to give you a moment in between each one of the words to pause and reflect and look at these reflection questions and see if God is stirring something in your heart. All right? All right, so simplicity or simple. It's the quality or condition of being easy to understand or easy to do. Dr. Robert Stackpole did a beautiful reflection on this, and some of his ideas are reflected in this uh, talk. But simplicity can be equated with the idea of being childlike. And to be honest, to be childlike is just about the hardest thing an adult human can be. Oliver Wendell Holmes said this, I would not give a fig for the simplicity this side of complexity, but I would give my life for the simplicity on the other side of complexity. And what he means by that is when you experience life and all of its complexities, which we do, right? If you can find peace on the other side of embracing all that, then you have found something. You have found something. For Christians, this means being able to hand our entire life over with all its complexities and complications in absolute trust to God. And what follows this simple act of faith is peace. Peace. Simplicity is not being in denial that things are complex. No, it's actually acknowledging that things are very complex and very complicated and often very messy. But that God is in charge. He's sovereign and he's able to handle the worst that we or life can hand to him, right? Christ said in Matthew 18, 1 through 4, he said, at that time, the disciples approached Jesus and said, hey, Jesus, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? You can just picture it, can't you? All right. And Jesus, you know, in his heart, just looked at them with love. And he looks around and he grabs a little child, pulls him forward. And he called a child over and placed it in their midst. And he said, Amen. I say to you, unless you turn, which means change, and repent, which means an about face, go walk the other way, right? Unless you turn and change and become like children, you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Wow. So what does it mean to be childlike? Well, childish and childlike sound a lot alike, but they're not the same, right? So childish means immature or, you know, selfish or ill-humored. And we can all think of people that we know that act like that, right? We don't want to be like that. But childlike, on the other hand, is the beauty and the simplicity and all the good things that are of a child, like joy, trust, innocence, curiosity, and the wonder of everything that's around them. The ability to quickly forgive. How many have seen their own children fighting one second and the next minute they're best buddies, right? Quick to forgive. Wouldn't that be nice if every human was quick to forgive, right? So, a happy and healthy child, for the most part, is trusting and worry-free. They trust God, they trust their parents, and they delight in all that's around them, and everything's play. Everything's a game. How many times did you hear or have you said, don't play with your food? With a kid, everything is like, woohoo, it's fun, right? 
A child that trusts his parents and God is not torn by competing allegiances. They just trust their parents that they're going to provide for them and, and, and give them you know, a safe place and take care of them. Life is really simple for a child. But we grown-ups, oh, things are so much more complicated. We have conflicting priorities and allegiances. We agonize over even the smallest things. We are anxious and worried by so many things. You know Martha, Martha? Do you know what Jesus said, Martha, Martha? What's the follow-up? You're anxious and worried about many things, right? So I think at least myself can be called Martha, Martha. And we try to serve God and mammon at the same time. And we put our trust in both. And Christ severely warned against this. But gospel simplicity is the gift of an undivided heart. An undivided heart. Simplicity of heart is to will one thing. To will one thing. And for Christians, that is to will whatever God wills. And that's all. We don't need to try to serve two masters or more, three or four. Our goal in life should be to have true simplicity of heart. Just to trust and to have one king sitting on the throne of our heart. So many times, I have to confess, I am on the throne of my heart and not God. It's what I want, my vanity, my pride, my sensuality. And they're all sitting there ruling, ruling over me. And you know what? This brings up questions. And I know when it's happening, because I start hearing this in my head. What will people think of you? What will people think if only three women show up for this retreat? Or, you know what? That person really made me mad. So I can just do this all by myself, and I'm going to show them, and I'm going to show the world. I don't need them. Or I don't really feel like doing that right now, even though you feel the nudge of God. I don't want to call her such a burden, so I better find something really good to do. I'll make up a really good excuse and start doing something I want to do and get really busy. So I know when I hear these things, it's me on the throne of my heart. But to have a simple heart is to have faith in a good God and to allow him to rule, to trust in his timing, his ways, his capabilities, to know that he can do a better job of ruling and managing me than I can. Isn't that awesome to think God is more for you than you are? And to trust in that goodness that no matter the outcome, especially if his idea is different than yours, Remember David? So we can see that the opposite of singleness of heart and simplicity of heart is what the Bible calls idolatry. Now, God put many, many, many verses in the Bible about idolatry, but it is funny how we like to skip over them because we think, oh, that's for the pagans 3,000 years ago. I would never bow down to a golden calf, right? I would never worship another god. But sadly, here's what the catechism says. It says this. It says, idolatry not only refers to false pagan worship, it remains a constant temptation to faith. Idolatry consists in divinizing, which is treating as one's highest allegiance and top priority what is not God. And then that's when man commits idolatry, whenever he honors and reveres a creature in the place of God. Idolatry rejects the unique lordship of God. It is therefore incompatible with communion with God. So idolatry is the opposite of simplicity of heart, of having one ruler on the throne of our heart. And listen to this. This is a really interesting thought. The danger of idolatry is this. If I have a false god or a false idol in my center or on my heart, an imposter king on the throne of my heart, it leads to multiply this. All right? It's a multiplication. You know why? Because not one single god other than the true god can do all that our god can do. And it brings about a divided allegiance and I will run after more and more of them and end up worshiping many gods because 
just God, one God won't do. And this produces an endless war in my heart. Hmm, which one's gonna take precedent today? What do I care most about this year? My image, making money, pleasure, power, drink, drugs, moving up in the work world, sex, or even really good things like keeping fit, my husband, my kids, their schools. The list is endless. What will take the throne of my heart today? Whatever we care about most from day to day is what we really worship. And as that changes from day to day, or even hour to hour, it sort of tears our lives apart. And the Catechism reminds us that human life finds its unity in the adoration of the one God. The commandment to worship the Lord alone integrates man and saves him from endless disintegration. In the Way of Divine Love, by Sister Josefa Mendez, sorry, Menendez. And she was a, a visionary and a contemporary of St. Faustina in Spain. Jesus said to her this, he said, leave yourself in my hands, Josefa. I will use you as seems best to me. What of your littleness and weakness? No matter, all I ask of you is to love and console me. I want you to know how dearly my heart loves you, how great are the riches it contains. And you must be, I love this, like soft wax that I may mold you to my liking. And Josepha's response to Christ's outreach was simple and single-hearted. She said, would that the whole world knew the secret of happiness. There is but one thing to do. Love and abandon oneself. Jesus himself will take charge of all the rest. So simplicity is to will one thing. To will whatever God wants. And then to joyfully in complete trust place all in his loving hands. So a quick check question to ask yourself if you have simplicity is this. Can I open my hand and offer this to God with childlike faith? Okay, you have one minute to look at the first question on, simple, on being simple. Thank you.